All right, guys, we are moving right along here, and um, this week you guys are going to be working to start designing and developing some of your programs now. Um, so we're going to start, I'm going to give a very short lecture this week. We're going to go over um, designing cardiorespiratory exercise programs. We went through assessing. Um, we'll still continue to talk about assessing um, because there's lots that we need to consider when assessing other than graded exercise tests, other than submaximal astrin tests. There's several others that we can use. Um, but let's talk a little bit about cardiovascular or cardiorespiratory fitness um, because this basically relates to the body's ability to generate energy and deliver oxygen to working muscles. Um, it's considered probably one of the most components of physical fitness, and it is one of the best indicators of overall health. So, um, cardiorespiratory training, cardio, you know, aerobic training, it's a foundation to any sport, uh, that any athlete plays just as strength training is the foundation to any sport that any athlete might train or play. Um, so aerobic exercise is best for developing your cardiovascular fitness. And you, you all know that aerobic means with oxygen. And this generally tends to include continuous activities that use oxygen. So this is not dealing with intermittent activities. This is dealing with things where you have rhythmic contractions that are long-term and continuous with uh, no breaks. So if we're talking things about walking or biking or jogging or skating or rowing, these are just kind of a few examples of what this is. And, and I know you know this, but I'm just, I'm just going over it just to make sure. Um, and these activities generally tend to strengthen not only the heart, and we'll talk, that's very generic, we'll talk about how the heart is strengthened, um, the lungs, and it, and it makes the working muscles way more efficient in using oxygen. And you know that because I've given you a lot of papers on that thus far. Um, and one of the major improvements that happens with this type of training is the increase in stroke volume. And you all know that's the amount of blood that is pumped out per heartbeat. So if we have more blood that is being pumped out, uh, that is going to help the heart work more efficiently. And it's also going to lower your resting heart rate. Um, and research shows to an average of 75 or 72 to 75 beats per minute. So that's, that's average athletes, um, generally are much lower. Um, and resting heart rates will vary, but it, it just understand that it has a profound impact on your resting heart rate because the heart begins to work more efficiently. Um, and then the longer we do this type of training, the more our endurance increases. So we do have cardiorespiratory or cardiovascular endurance, um, and that increases as well. So Let's talk about uh, how, just how difficult this can be. So let's look at the next slide here. And I put here that exercise prescription. Now that you're learning to prescribe, it is absolutely an art. Uh, and it's an art because there is no one size that fits all. And that's one of the things I'm going to challenge you and your teams on over these next few weeks um, is how to prescribe an exercise for a very unique individual. Um, so you got to target your client's goals. And it's is it a fitness goal? Is it a health goal? Is it both? So what is the difference between fitness and health? I'll let you kind of figure that out. Um, and then we're going to use these uh, variables to kind of affect the goals and increase um, stimulus so that we can progress through certain certain tiers of fitness. So the first thing you got to realize, and I've said this before in previous lectures, is that we have to individualize exercise prescription for everybody. There's no one size that fits all. If any of you guys go to work on, uh, go to work with a team, uh, let's say you get on a, you're a strength coach for a football team. You need to know how to approach that entire team. You can't train everybody like a wide receiver. You can't train everybody like a linebacker. You can't train everybody like a running back. So you have to know what the individual needs and demands of the people and the positions are in order to make them as um, explosive and functional in that position uh, as possible. So we have to basically assess who we are working with. We have to determine what our goals and our settings are going to be. 
Uh, we have to figure out what the prescription is going to be, and then we have to administer it. And then once we do it, we have to go back and we have to assess again. And this is where all of those assessments come in, like the graded exercise um, treadmill assessment or the submaximal assessment. So this is where we go back and we say, okay, we started here. We implemented this plan. Now let's go back and see if it works. And guess what? If these values don't increase, that means that everything you've done here is wrong. So I want you to remember this slide. I want you to remember these steps because this is going to be an important component of your, your project that you're going to present to me. And just to show you how important that is, I'm going to put a note here that uh, Mr. B uh, will ask us about this for sure okay so now it has been uh, written into the archives and i'm going to copy and paste this because i'm going to put this in other places so let's say i say to you guys hey um i want you to work with somebody who is a diabetic and they have no fitness level or no then and their health is very poor how are you going to do these things how are you going to assess them what are the goals you're going to set for them what are the exercise prescription you're going to use and we'll talk more about this in in a bit and again keep in mind that this is focusing purely on cardiorespiratory fitness we haven't included muscular fitness or respiratory or um, flexibility or anything like that in there okay so what we're going to use to to manipulate this part specifically let me just copy that is we're going to use this fit principle and i'm going to put this right here because you better know this and um, we're going to use a principle that has a, a couple other additions to it. But for now, just understand that we got to start manipulating these frequency of exercise, intensity of exercise, time of exercise, type of exercise. This is also called mode of exercise. So you might see type or mode. And then we'll see something called volume and something called pr progression. So let's just throw this in here so that we see a v and a p and this will come later um so it's going to be fit vp and this stands for volume and this stands for progression so i can even put it like this to make it look prettier now it looks like it kind of belongs there you go let's line it all up and boop there you go it it fits perfectly okay so um you can see here that I'm just kind of giving you a, a flavor of what's coming down the pipe and some things to start thinking about is, is if I tell you I want you to work with somebody that's a beginner, well, you can look at some of these beginner um, phases here. And this is a beginner would be three to five days a week, right? This is ACSM. This is nothing new to you. Intensity of the exercise would be less than 145 beats per minute. So you can use heart rate. We can also use heart rate reserve. We could also use VO2 reserve. I'll explain that to you guys in a little bit. We could also use METs, right? We can all we can use all these indicators here um, to to kind of determine what the intensity is going to be. So intensity is inversely inversely related with time, right? So if we have high intensity, we're going to have low time. If we have low intensity, we're going to have high time, right? So these two guys are inversely related. Um, and that's important too, because if I said, hey, I, you know, for your project, I'm going to have you and your team work with somebody that is a soccer player and they play soccer um, three days a week and um, they're not athletes, but they are highly active, then, well, obviously, if you're trying to get them to perform better in whatever task that is, and let's go back here. Who is your subject? Okay, it's a soccer player. How would you assess them? Well, if they're a soccer player, you could probably do a VO2 graded assessment. What are their goals? Well, that's where the soccer player says, well, I am a um, midfielder and I'm slow. My sprints are terrible and I'm not getting to the ball and I'm losing the ball. Okay, well, now that I know the goals, we can set the prescription and then we would go to our fit model and say, okay, well, if we want to increase power, 
and we want to increase um, how ground force production and how quickly you can move through a space, well, that's going to be very high intensity, right? So we can see that the intensity in this case is going to be 145 to 186. And how can we measure that? Well, we can put a heart rate monitor on them and make sure that when we are exercising them, we can keep them within their time frame that are or their, their uh, beats per minute that we want it, we want them to be in, right? Um, if they're trying to work on their sprints, well, if the intensity is high, the time is going to be lower. So again, you know, maybe we don't want 30 to 60 minutes. Okay. Now I'm just giving you guys examples of what you need to think about to go back to this and tell you that it is truly an art, right? It, this is an art trying to figure this out. And rarely does, do we ever get it right on the first time, right? So you, rarely do we ever say, oh, wow, we saw a massive increase in this person's speed. Um, now, keep in mind, I just talked about power. I talked about explosiveness. That is not cardiorespiratory fitness, okay? But I'm just giving you examples of, of how I can manipulate or how I can ask you questions on this project that you're going to be working on, okay? Um, so keep that in mind. Um, where was I at? Let me go back. Okay. So we talked about the frequency. So how often are they doing it? We have something for beginners and people who are, uh, you know, work out quite a bit, intensity of exercise, time of exercise, type of exercise. This also is refers to as mode of exercise. And since we are talking about cardiorespiratory fitness, this is continuous activity. Okay, that requires oxygen. So it's not anaerobic, it is aerobic. So some other things that you need to think about when you are preparing this video for me and this project for me is how are you going to warm them up? So here is some basic warm-ups that ACSM suggest. I do um, hope you pay attention to this and you look over it. I'm not going to read this to you because it's very simple. You guys can do it. Um, this is probably one of the most important factors is increasing core temperature. And also it's not on here, um, but uh, flexibility and muscle performance is also based heavily on muscle hydration. So this does not have uh, any, this does not show anything with that, but know that this is when we warm them up, dependent on the person, right? A soccer player is going to warm up completely different than somebody that has um, hypertension, hypertensive disorder, right? Um, you got to think about how you're going to warm the person up based upon, let me just go back, boop, who is the patient? Who is the subject? Who are we working with, right? So we can do a longer warm up if there's somebody that is very sedentary, or if it's uh, yes, the soccer player came uh, to work with you today and you said, oh, how did you get here? He, he says, oh, I ran. Oh, okay, well, you're already warmed up. We don't need to spend much time with you warming up, right? So again, individualize the exercise prescription for everybody, and part of that prescription is the warm up. Okay, so following the warm up, we got to consider the sequence of events that are going to happen. And here is the elements of cardiorespiratory workouts. Um, so, of course, we're going to have the warm up. We're going to have the endurance conditioning. Uh, that's going to be the actual uh, exercise component. Um, we'll have the cool down, and then we're going to have the stretching. Again, this is just as equally important as the warm up. Um, and again, very simple stuff. So when we're talking about the endurance conditioning part, right? So we're talking about this part now, boom, I'm going to highlight it. Here's what we have to consider. We are going to follow the fit VP principle. Here it is fit VP. And I'm going to go over all these things with you in lots of detail. So you have plenty of, um, plenty of reference to it. We want to make sure we are doing 20 to 60 minutes per session. Now that's, that's a 40 minute discrepancy between that. It depends on who you're working with. Again, we got to individualize our prescription. So we got to know who the person is. And also this time is going to depend on intensity. Okay. So again, I told you that this and this are inversely related. All right. So you guys are all young, strapping young lads and ladettes, and you work out very hard. You all have very healthy uh, bodies at this age right now. So I'm sure you work out very intensely, right? So think about HIIT training, high intensity interval training. That is very different than running three miles, right? Your heart rate is going to be much higher. 
oxygen consumption will probably be much, much higher. Um, caloric burn is going to be much higher. Fatigue level is going to be much higher. But you won't be able to exercise as long as if you were doing a three-mile run where you can control the pace, slow down, and, and uh, do the three miles. Okay, so the um, – there it is. The time and the dependency the, – the, I'm sorry. The time and the intensity are interdependent on one another. Uh, a minimal single bout duration should be 10 minutes continuously, right? That's a minimal bout. Um, and you should accumulate 30 minutes per day or 20 minutes per day. So this would be moderate intensity physical activity or vigorously intensity, vigorous intensity physical activity. Okay. So so time, again, is associated with intensity. If we are going low and slow, that would be moderate. We want to do an extra 10 minutes. If we're going hard and fast, vigorous, that would be 20 minutes. So again, I'm just showing you that relationship between time and intensity. Um, and then cool down. So we're, we're, let's go back. Let's go back to this. Now we're talking about the cool down. So cool downs. Uh, immediately follows the endurance training, low intensity exertion, about five to 10 minutes. And you want to pay attention to the heart rate and the blood pressure and make sure they return back to your pre-exercise levels or your resting levels. Okay. Um, and we want to basically make sure that we're not pooling any blood. We want to make sure that, we, you know, we don't have any um, issues that we're dealing with, such as post-exercise dizziness or fainting, because if that's, if that's the case, then maybe we went a bit too hard. Um, so again, these are just simple factors to keep in mind, but let's see if it shows up. Nope, it's not showing up, but let me steal this. These are factors that I am going to ask you about because I'm going to tell you to design me what this looks like. So not, I'm not going to ask you to say, hey, if we cool down, how many minutes should it be? I'm going to say, hey, you're going to dig deep and you're going to show me what type of stretches you're going to do uh, for 10 minutes. You're going to tell me what the rationale is for um, doing these stretches for 10 minutes. Okay. So we're going to start creating the, the programming now, and that's going to include not only, not only the assessment, we spent a lot of time doing the assessment. We're also going to talk about goals. We're also going to have you guys prescribe and then tell me how you would reassess and why. So this is, this is going to be the task for your last two exams. Okay. Um, and then stretching, you guys can you guys can read that. I'm not going to read that for you guys. Okay. Now we're going to get down to the, the nitty gritty here. So we're going to get into some science. Um, so exercise prescription. So when, so the best way, and I mentioned this earlier, the best way to improve your cardiorespiratory endurance is to participate in aerobic activities. And here we're talking about using the body's larger muscles to move in a rhythmic manner. And not only are we moving in a rhythmic manner, we're doing it for a sustained period of time so we can increase the body's need, the overall need for oxygen. And that's that's the definition of aerobic activities. So again, we're talking about activities like biking and running and swimming and walking, uh, walking at a brisk pace. Um, sports such as soccer and basketball all have aerobic components. Again, it depends on the position, right? Um, and also remember that your, your cardiorespiratory fitness, as it increases, you'll be able to do these activities for a longer period of time and at a higher intensity, right? So if we're assessing something, where is it? Assessing something and we're doing it right through our prescription. And then when we administer it and we go back and assess it, both intensity and time should increase. So let's let's just quickly draw for a moment here. Um, if we're talking about a graded exercise test, right, uh, and we're changing our, we're doing the Bruce Coat protocol, and every two minutes we increase the grade, and 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 we increase the grade, right? Let's say when you did your initial assessment, um, 
this is two. I'm drawing with my right hand, so just bear with me. Two, four, six, eight. That's getting pretty good, guys. Ten. I might be ambidextrous pretty soon here. Uh, Twelve. Let's say when you did the initial assessment, they fatigued at six minutes. Okay, so they they stopped at six minutes. Their lactate levels were high. They're, um, they didn't reach a peak VO2, right? I got you guys on that quit that test question. I asked you if most people reach a peak VO2. No, most people don't. So let's say at six minutes, they plateaued though, right? So their oxygen consumption plateaued. And let's say their VO2 was, let's just say 38 milliliters per kilogram of body weight. Okay. So that was before we did our assessment of goals. We did our exercise prescription and we administered it. And let's say uh, after four to six weeks, let's pick Humboldt, Space Humboldt Blue here. Let's say we came back again. Uh, let's say, let's just say, oh, that's really spacey. Eight weeks later. We came back eight weeks later and we put them on that same graded exercise, exercise test. Let's say they hit the four minute mark, they're going strong. They hit the six minute mark, they're going strong. They hit the eight minute mark, they're going strong. They get to 10 and they fatigued. So not only did they increase their time, right? They increased their time on the treadmill, but they also increased their intensity, which means they also more than likely, if they're able to increase their time and their intensity, they're also probably going to increase their VO2 score. So let's say we did it again and they got a 42 milliliters per, kilo, per kilogram of body weight. So that tells me that, okay, I assessed them right. The goals were accurate. We designed and we administrated these things perfectly. And as a result, we went back and evaluated and we see that they increased their VO2 score by four points, which is actually very robust. They increased their time on the VO2 by uh, four extra minutes, which means they increased their intensity by, uh, you know, a certain degree as well. So that's, that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do here is, um, we're trying to make sure that we increase their endurance. We increase their intensity and how long they can do cardiorespiratory fitness for. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about this. You guys all know this, but I'm just going to go through it to make sure. So we don't get any mistakes on the, um, the, the quiz or the project that you guys are doing. Uh, when we classify these activities, they're either aerobic or anaerobic and what we're really talking about here is the energy systems, right? So you guys, uh, that all took, um, Exercise physiology, we spent a lot of times talking about the glycolytic pathways, the uh, intermittent pathways, and then the aerobic or the oxidative pathways. So what we're really talking about here is what is the fuel? What is the molecules that are being used to generate ATP to sustain exercise activities, right? Um, and we know that the muscle um, needs energy to produce movement. Um and when we're talking about the aerobic part, we're talking about with oxygen, we're talking about uh, so those glucose molecules going into pyruvate and pyruvate going into the mitochondria. And we're talking about that being uh, converted into energy. We're talking about the electron carriers, NADPH and FAD. Uh, I'm sorry, NADH and FAD um, bring in those electrons that those are generated through the um, glycolytic pathway. They're bringing those electrons down to the mitochondria and they're donating those electrons to the electron transport chain. And we have energy being generated, right? So you guys know that I'm just, just reviewing it for the sake of reviewing it. And then when we consider about, when we talk about these changes that help us increase intensity and increase endurance and increase time, um, these are the adaptations that we're talking about. So we're going to get these physiological changes, these physiological adaptations that are going to occur that are going to let us work out longer and harder. Okay. So when I mention physiological adaptations, this is what I'm talking about. So the cardiorespiratory system, when we are exercising frequently, when we are, um, when we are doing this continuously and it's designed and it's, uh, it's repetitiously happening, then we're going to increase heart size and volume. So 
left ventricle will undergo left ventricle hypertrophy. And with that, we'll be able to eject more blood forcefully out into the systemic into the system. Um, and that's going to increase your stroke volume, right? Um, we'll increase blood volume and we'll increase total hemoglobin. And that's wonderful because when we exercise and we get more hemoglobin, that means we have more O2 carrying capacity, right? So we can deliver more oxygen. And not only can we do it through hemoglobin, we can also do it through the increase in we modify our heart. So th these two things work together. So stroke volume is going to increase both at rest and during exercise. So that means during both, when your stroke volume increases, we are going to have a decrease in resting heart rate, and we're going to have a decrease in exercising heart rate, right? Because these adaptations are occurring. If we have a high blood pressure, um, and again, let me go back just to say individualize who is the, let me clean all this up. My gosh, that looks like 1980s just threw up on this slide here and it's just kind of a hot mess. All right. Um, see, I just dated myself because I grew up in the 80s and you guys probably were not even thought of. Um, so anyways, if, um, if somebody has high blood pressure, right, then that's going to be in the goals and the setting, right? Okay. What, what are the goals? What are we, what are we trying to do with this person? Uh, well, we're trying to decrease their high blood pressure. Okay. Well, if we do cardiorespiratory fitness for a certain amount of time, well, we're going to get these adaptations and that's going to decrease that, right? So this stuff is all interrelated with one another. So let me clean this up for you guys. Okay. Uh, cardiac output is going to be higher. VO2 is going to be higher. Oxygen injected into the blood. I already told you that right through uh, ejection fraction is going to be higher and you're going to increase your lung volume. So you'll be able to bring in more air. Now, this would be central adaptations. You guys read that paper on central and peripheral adaptations. This is our central. This is our peripheral. So now at the skeletal muscle, we're going to have an increase in mitochondria networks. So they're going to get bigger and we're going to get more of them. And that's that's wonderful because if you looked up here, I just told you we're going to have more oxygen being delivered. So if this is a stimulus, if we have more O2 coming down the bloodstream here, well, then the muscle has to undergo adaptations to basically take this in and utilize it, right? So that it only makes sense. Myoglobin stores are going to increase. If you don't know what myoglobin is, that's basically what's going to receive the oxygen and deliver it to the mitochondria in the, uh, in the skeletal muscle. Triglyceride stores are going to increase in the muscle, right? So, um, if you ever heard of the athlete's dilemma or the runner's dilemma, if you did a muscle biopsy on a, a trained runner, you would see that they store just as much fat in their muscle as somebody with diabetes. And that's why it's called the dilemma. But What's interesting about it is somebody that has, uh, that is a runner or a marathon runner, they're putting this in their muscle as an immediate source of energy so that their muscle can have it readily available while it's also circulating it's fatty acids from, uh, the adipose sites, right. Or the fat cells. Um, so it's, it's like kind of having like an in-house, uh, storage of energy in the muscle for immediate use. Right. So. Um, we're also going to increase our ability to use fatty acids, uh, to, to create energy. Right. And then we're also going to have some other systems that are going to increase, um, strength of connective tissue, um, high density. Uh, so we're going to have our HDLs increase, right? So those are our, our, where did that go? Okay. High. Oh, that's weird. That's trippy. High density lipids are going to increase, which means that, which means let's go back really quick. If we have somebody that is overweight and type two diabetic or overweight and has uh, dyslipidemia or hyperlipidemia, right? So that means they have a lot of kind of fat circulating. These are fat little globules here circulating in their blood. Well, if we put them through a training exercise or if we put them through cardiorespiratory fitness, let me clean this up. Well, one of the things that's going to happen here is we're going to have an increase in their high density lipids, which is the really good ones. And then we're also going to have a decrease. 
that's an arrow going down, in their low density lipids, their LDLs, which is great because LDLs are super, super high in people that have diabetes or issues like that. Okay. So use this slide to kind of help you map out some of the questions I'm going to ask you. All right, let's go to the next one. So um, one of the things I told you is that your cardiac output, your stroke volume, and your heart rate are all going to uh, get better um, if we if we do this type of uh, this type of exercising. Um, so let's let's talk about this a, a little bit. So if we were talking about the the heart, right, in the cardiovascular system, we know that there would be some major improvements that come with fitness and, and cardiac output is one of them. And again, this is just, it's simply the amount of blood that is leaving the heart per minute. So we're going to have an increase in the amount of blood that is leaving the heart per minute. Okay. Uh, and we can do it in liters per minute or milliliters per minute. Okay. Um, and this is going to happen on a beat to beat um, occasion. So, um, stroke volume is also going to get better. What is stroke volume? That is the amount of blood, um, the heart pumps with each beat. Okay. So we're talking about overall cardiac output increases. So that's how much per minute. And then stroke volume is on a beat to beat basis. There's going to be an increase in blood being pumped out. Okay. Um, heart rate is also going to be altered. Um, so basically our cardiac output is going to be stroke volume times heart rate. So cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. I'm sure you guys already know that. Um, and again, some other changes that are going to happen in the heart is we're going to have increased, uh, contractile force. So basically the heart, when it, when the left ventricle fills, let me see if I can <laughs> dare, I try to draw this, but, uh, maybe you guys can make fun of me when you see me in person and just be like, you draw like a child. If I'm drawing this left ventricle, okay. That's this guy right here. When the left ventricle fills with blood, it's going to expand its size, right? So let's say this is an untrained heart. And it fills, it fills with oxygenated blood. And once it fills, it goes about this wide. Okay. This is uh, that dotted line that I just drew there. And this is going to be like a rubber band, right? So the, the wider we stretch that left ventricle, the more snapback it's going to have. And the more snapback it has, the more blood that's going to leave. This is blood drops going to leave the heart. Okay. So when we begin to exercise and we do this cardiovascular fitness, let me pick a new color here. We begin to increase contractile force. So what happens is we get, we get more hemoglobin, right? We get more blood. Let's just go back and review. Where's that picture at? Here we go. I told you we get more blood volume and we get more hemoglobin. So what's, what's that going to do? Well, if we get more blood volume than normal, that's going to make this left ventricle, um, expand much larger than it was before we started exercising. So you guys see this, uh, other perimeter here that I'm, I'm drawing around the outside of the heart. Um, now, because we have more blood volume filling this left ventricle, we're going to have even greater snapback. So it's got this rubber band here going to build a lot of tension and then it's going to snap back in like that. And as a result here, we had four blood drops. Now we're going to have, this is just generic, but I'm just trying to give you a visual, much more blood being ejected. Okay. Uh, into the, the circulate into the circulation. So that's what happens when we design, we get more blood volume. Uh, we get greater elasticity. I kind of showed you that there. Think of a rubber band, right? If we pull the rubber band this far back and snapped it, uh, that'd be great. But if we pulled it this far back, we'd get even more. And this is what's increasing stroke volume 
And this is what the same mechanism is what's going to decrease your heart rate because your heart is becoming more efficient at pumping. Okay, so now let's start looking at, uh, let's start kind of putting some pieces together here, right? We talked about assessing um, O2 consumption during cardiorespiratory activities. Um, I have this oxygen consumption during exercise slide here so that you guys can kind of put some of this together because it's a bit unfortunate. We're not in the lab. It makes things kind of harder to understand. So let's talk about this. So in this slide, you can see changes in oxygen consumption during an acute bout of exercise, right? So you hear, you see here, rest, begin, steady state recovery, right? And then you see time zero to 25 minutes. And then you see this red line, which is just kind of indicating how much oxygen oxygen is being used. All right. So um, we were talking about uh, VO2 and we were talking about peak VO2 and we were talking about these graded exercise tests. And this is, this is kind of a picture that's going to kind of show you how these things are measured and and why we use the uh, indirect calorimeter or indirect calorimetry to measure breath by breath. So I want you to imagine yourself uh, going for a run or a bike ride or, or, or going swimming. Pick, pick whatever aerobic activity you want and imagine yourself going through these stages. So at the very beginning, um, on the left part of the picture here where you can see rest, we have resting levels of oxygen. And if we think about what one met is, that's 3.5 liters of oxygen that most of us consume at rest. That's a fixed number. So we can say this is 3.5 right here. Um, and, um, you, and you can see that here, that red line indicates that. Um, and resting levels of oxygen consumption your stroke volume, your heart rate, your breathing rate, all of these things are very low at rest. All right. So heart rate, stroke volume, breathing rate, they're all low during rest. Now, um, when we look at the zero to five minute range here, let me just pull out a highlighter and just highlight that. Okay. You can see that there are some, oh, that's not a highlighter. That's an eraser. You can see that there are some subtle changes, right? So think about a graded exercise test when you're on a VO2 max test, right? If there's a change in stimulus, there's going to be a change in oxygen consumption. There's going to be a change in heart rate. There's going to be a change in stroke volume because you're starting to exercise. And that's going to keep changing with increases in intensity. Let me just kind of put these things here really quick so that I have them up here for you guys. Um, let's put it right there um, just so that you remember that these things are changing. Let's make it white so you guys can see it. Okay, oxygen consumption stroke volume, heart rate, breathing rate, all of these things are going to increase with increases in stimulus, right? So if we went from rest to jogging, you can see that oxygen consumption is going to increase. Um, and um, from the zero to five minute mark, you can see that in the green section here, and I'm just kind of repeating this just in case this is blurry, because I know sometimes these things get blurry. Um, this position is generally called your O2 deficit. Um, and why do we call it an O2 deficit? So this is your oxygen deficit area. And this is, we go into an oxygen deficit here because we just started the activity. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, your run, your swim, or your bike, whatever you decided, you just began. Now, as we're beginning this exercise, there the the oxygen that you need and the muscles that need that oxygen, we're not bringing in enough oxygen for that yet. So the working muscles need to be supplied with some type of energy. And it needs to be supplied with some type of energy until we get our heart rate and our breathing and our stroke volume. We get it all here at steady state. <coughs> Pardon me again. Um, so let me let me draw this for you guys here. Let me see. Where's my drawing at? What happened to draw? Why can't I find it? There it is. Okay. So this. Oh, my goodness. Highlighter. 
Yes. Yes. Thank you. This is steady state. So before the heart, before the stroke volume, before the breathing and before the O2 levels catch up to this, we have to pay this debt with something. And what do we pay it with? Well, because there's more oxygen needed by your working muscles that we can supply until we get here, we got to borrow this energy from somewhere else. And this is where you see this, this, this section here, this deficit is where we cross over from anaerobic to aerobic. So let me clean this up a little bit. Let's go back to exercise physiology. <coughs> Excuse me again. Um, we know that anaerobic activity generally lasts anywhere from zero to 30 seconds, 40 seconds, depends on the athlete, right? Once we get into a minute here, we're kind of looking into the aerobic activity. So, so this, this at the onset of exercise, we are paying the working muscles are using other things than oxygen to basically get these things ramped up, right? To get the oxygen consumption up, the stroke volume up, the heart rate up, the breathing rate up, to get it up to this steady state, okay? So this is where we have that connection between aerobic and anaerobic. So although you're participating in this aerobic exercise, some of the energy that is being delivered to your muscles to fuel those muscles at the beginning or the onset of exercise to do the movement, is being done so through the anaerobic energy system. And here at the very beginning, you can see that there's uh, a pretty sharp increase in oxygen consumption, heart rate, breathing rate, all of these things. There's a massive increase here uh, because we went from rest to the, the onset of exercise. Um, and then from about five to 20 minutes during your aerobic activity, right? You see this steady state here, you reach something called steady state. And here, the, acti the activity becomes truly aerobic. Your breathing rate, your heart rate, your oxygen consumption, all these things stabilize across this period, okay? This is where we are truly in an aerobic capacity, all right? And it's important because I want you to, when we think about this prescription and administrating the prescription, I want you to think about how important time can be right because if you say okay you're just going to exercise for 10 minutes well where where are we let me clean this up a little bit where are we with oxygen where are we with challenging the body with stimulus right i mean we really are only about what five minutes into aerobic activity right so think about that i'm just trying to give you more pieces to think about Okay, so now imagine that you stop running at 20 minutes. Okay, let's so we, we did a 20 minute run. And now we get into this recovery period. And even though you have stopped running here, even though you have stopped running, your oxygen consumption remains, it means above resting levels, right? So look at here's the resting level. Let me just let's use a red line. So it kind of matches. First, let me clean this up because I don't want anyone being confused. Okay, so our resting levels are right about here, right? And even though we stopped exercising, look at where we are. And it takes a while for us to come down. Um, and um, it doesn't immediately drop back down to resting levels. And, it, and it's doing this in order to replenish the oxygen supply throughout your body. Okay, so we're we're basically bringing in more oxygen at this kind of slow pace so we can regenerate all the oxygen um, that we want to resupply the oxygen throughout the body. And so you can see here that the changes in your oxygen consumption throughout an acute bout of exercise are very dynamic. All right. So essentially when we're recovering, we're kind of paying back this debt, right? Um, because this, I'm just going to put, uh, a N for anaerobic. This was where we went into the bank of our energy and we said, Hey bank, I need a loan. I need to borrow some currency or ATP, right? I need to borrow some currency 
in order to pay for this steady state. But I promise you, once I get in steady state during this recovery phase, when I bring in a lot of oxygen, even though I'm done exercising, it's going to pay you back. All right. And we don't get to this until about five minutes. And again, keep in mind, we are trying to supply oxygen consumption. We are trying to supply stroke volume. We're increasing our heart rate. That takes energy. We're increasing our breathing rate. That takes energy. It all comes from this here, right? So we call this um, oxygen deficit. And I, I just wanted to kind of share that with you guys. So you had a clearer picture on um, how some of these processes work, right? Because that's important for you to understand when you're prescribing time and you're prescribing intensity. Now, of course, if we were doing a graded exercise test, right? Let's kind of, let's just draw this out, right? We went from rest and after two minutes, we increased, we increased, we increased, we increased. Well, every time we increase, the oxygen consumption is going to rise, right? And then eventually, once we cannot bring in any more oxygen, we, our body cannot use it in any higher capacity, it flattens out, right? And that's how a graded VO2 works, a uh, graded exercise test. Okay, let's get on here. So um, measuring, again, we talked a lot about this. I just wanted to bring it in. Um, we, we can do the VO2 max test. Um, we can directly measure that gas exchange, or we can do indirect measurements like we did with the Astran. I gave you two very different uh, ways of doing that. Um, and here are some different, here's that Astran. We can do it either with the mouthpiece in, or we can do it without the mouthpiece and do the calculations. Um, and just kind of bringing that back in here because, because you have to reassess. Oops, I'm trying to clean that up with my eraser. There we go. Right. We eventually, we will have to, we will have to, once we prescribe, and we think about, okay, well, I got to think about these adaptations. I got to think about how is the body using oxygen during this exercise. I got to think about how we're going to measure it. Uh, when you come back through, after you administered and you prescribed and we come back through, we're going to have to reevaluate and we want to see some changes, right? We want to be able to see some changes that have hurt, that have happened. Okay, so... Let's talk about now um, these prescription factors, okay? And we have um, mode, intensity, frequency, and duration. We're going to talk about those first, and then we'll talk about um, these other ones, such as volume and progression, okay? So uh, where did that go? Okay, so these are the things that we have to think about when we get to these two sections all right again we got to know who the person is we got to know what the goals are and if they don't know what the goals are then we got to help them and you know we we are the exercise professionals we have to be able to tell them uh if they don't know what's good for them we're going to help them kind of figure that out right um intensity we want to have uh moderate intensity because we are dealing with um healthy individuals when we're talking about anything with acsm and frequency and duration, these are just some basic guidelines. We want to target about 150 to 300 minutes per week. This is ACSM standards. And then the duration is going to depend on the intensity. Okay, so let's get down to the nitty gritty here. Um, and let's just refresh. So uh, types of cardiovascular fitness exercises include rhythmic, repetitive activities, that involve large muscle groups and are performed over prolonged periods of time. So that being said, intensity is going to be low and time is going to be high. And that's, I just wanted to kind of start off with that. So the types of activities, um, per, these type of activities provide the greatest improvements in cardiovascular fitness. And uh, I have I will show you guys a list of activities. Uh, there's also one in your textbook that you guys can look at. But let's talk about frequency of exercise. So let's look at this one here. So uh, maximum cardiovascular benefits are achieved when you engage in exercise three to five days a week. All right. And that three to five days a week should be equivalent to 
150 minutes to 300 minutes per week. This is average. This is all average. Okay. So keep that in mind. Let me just go back here and make sure Mr. B is doing his job. So you guys can't be like, well, you didn't say this because I, I get that a lot. So let me just, let me just copy this. We'll just make this painful. Um, where was I at? Here we go. Where did it go? There you go. I will ask you about this for sure. Um, and we recommend, uh, this is the general range for, um, uh, just to improve general fitness. Okay. And that looks like something was chopped off there. Okay. No, it wasn't. Okay. So, uh, we can do this five days a week and this would be moderate intensity or we could do three days a week and that would be vigorous intensity, or you can do a combination of the two. And there's evidence out there that shows when you do combination training, it's just as effective. Okay. If we talk about intensity, so we're going to use some of that language that we were talking about with VO2 and METs and things like that. Um, intensity refers to how hard you are working. You guys know that intensity is one of the most important ways to determine if you're exercising at a level that benefits your heart. So we got to keep the heart within a certain heart range or within a certain met range or within a certain VO2 reserve range. And this is probably a new term for you guys. And I'll explain this to you in a moment, what VO2 reserve is. Or we want to be within a certain heart rate reserve area. So we can use heart rate reserve uh, instead of VO2 reserve. And I'm going to give you guys a, how to, uh, an easy way to calculate these. Probably not in this slide, but I'll, I'll do another one, um, another small little lecture um, where I use the iPad and I draw it out for you. Um, and we basically, we want to keep uh, the heart within a certain zone, right? So or the intensity within a certain zone. And, and older textbooks describe this as target heart rate training. I'm sure you've seen that before. So in general, this means that we're exercising at a level where the heart is beating within 50 to 85% of a maximum heart rate, right? So if we did the 220 minus age, that would give us an approximate maximum heart rate. And we want to be somewhere in that range, okay? So somewhere between 80 I'm sorry, 50 to 85% of someone's maximum heart rate. Um, and again, that's just one way to do it, but there's better ways to determine this intensity. And that's by using three to six METs or 40 to 60% of someone's heart rate reserve or VO2 reserve. Or if we're doing vigorous intensity figure, um, physical activity, now we're talking about six or more METs and a range of 60 to 89% of someone's VO2 reserve. And I'll, I will show this to you. If you don't understand it, don't worry about it right now. Just kind of keep these ranges in mind. Um, and then we can talk about the mode or the type of activity that we're going to do. And since we're doing cardiorespiratory fitness, this is aerobic training, large muscle groups, rhythmic action, little skill that require. Um, and we're going to talk more about kind of how we figure out somebody's skill set in a moment, because again, we have to individual the ex individualize the exercise prescription. And when we're talking about this here and this and this, we got to figure out, is this person skilled or not? Um, and it, it kind of depends on how frequently they exercise or if they're somebody who was sedentary and just got off the couch, well, obviously they're not going to have skill sets like agility and balance and flexibility, um, or speed or acceleration or deceleration or endurance, right. Uh, versus somebody that does work out far more often, they'll have these skills, which means we can start them at a different level. They don't have to start at the ground floor per se. Okay. So we talked about frequency. We talked about intensity. These are all the ranges that ACSM wants you to know. Now we're going to talk about duration. So duration is how long you should exercise within, within these ranges. All right. So duration is going to depend on these variables. Okay. 
So um, how long are we going to exercise within those intensities that I showed you before? And um, to achieve the greatest amount of fitness, it's got to be within 20 to 60 minutes. And why is that? Well, now this is making sense, I hope. And this is why I showed you this picture that's not in your textbook, but I just figured it would do good to have this picture for you. It's got to be 20 to 60 minutes because we're not even using oxygen at a steady state until we get five minutes in, right? And if you're deconditioned, this might be even longer, right? If you're somebody that's in tremendous shape and you run a lot, this steady state might happen here, right? Because you're in shape, right? So if you're in shape, that could happen. If you're somebody that's very deconditioned, it might go like this, guys. It might take you damn near 10 minutes to get into that steady state. All right. And again, this is why you need to know this. Okay. So it's, there is no, that's why I told you it's an art. There is no one size fits all for this. Okay. Um, and we want this to be when we're talking about let me go back here. Uh, duration. We want it to be continuous. We do not want it to be intermittent. Intermittent would be something that, um, you know, if you're playing basketball and you sprint and then you walk and you sprint and then you walk, that means that uh, you're kind of stopping, right? You're stopping and you're switching when you do stuff like that. Let's go back. Where is it at? Um, we are switching metabolic pathways. When we do intermittent exercise, we're going from this to this, to this, to this, right? Every time we stop and rest, we're changing the metabolic demands of the muscle. And that's why we don't want to do intermittent. We want to keep it oxidative. Um, so we'll get the best cardiovascular benefits if we do this within, let me find that, 150 minutes per week. Okay. Um, that would be moderate intensity exercise or 20 to 60 minutes per week, which would be vigorous activity exercise or a combination of the two. Okay. So kind of, um, again, it's just as effective if you combine them, right? So let's say on Monday you do a slow workout, right? Moderate intensity on Wednesday, you're feeling great. You do vigorous, right? And then on Friday, right? Because we want to do at least where to go at least three days a week, right? So let's say on Friday, we do vigorous again. So this, this combination of one moderate and two vigorous is going to increase your, uh, that's my arrow, your O2 capacity. It's going to increase your VO2. It's going to increase your peak VO2. It's going to have all these benefits, uh, that are going to, let's go back here, lead to this, right? Cause this is ultimately what we're trying to do guys. We're trying to change our physiology. That's why we exercise. If we don't exercise, we change our physiology by getting fat, right? Uh, that's a, that's a face and here's some legs, right? But if we exercise, we can reduce fat and we can positively have favorable adaptations that are going to increase our ability to exercise overall. Uh, volume. Okay. So volume is generally a combination of everything. So there's lots of different ways to, to calculate volume and volume can be, okay, if I went into the gym today and, and I'm not going to go into tremendous detail on volume because I'm going to let you and your groups figure out how you want to calculate volume. I could say I worked out five days this week and the week after that, I worked out five days and then I can say, okay, well in two weeks, I worked out 10 times, right? Five times two is 10. So my volume for the two weeks was 10. You can also do volume by distance, right? So yesterday I ran a mile today. I ran two miles tomorrow. I'm going to run three miles. This week I ran five miles or six miles. I forgot what I said, but anyways, my volume was six miles. Um, but one of the ways you can do it is by calories or you can do it by Mets, right? So there's all these different ways to, to calculate volume. And this is going to be up to you. Uh, that's a why. Oh yeah. My right hand is getting so much better. You and the team that you are working with on this project. And I will, uh, yeah, you and your team and then progression. 
how are you going to increase their ability to adapt? Um, and uh, there's basically you're going to increase the demand. You're going to increase the level of intensity, whether it's by, let's say, frequency. Let's say uh, when you first started working with somebody, they could only work out three days a week and they were exhausted. And then after five weeks of working with you, you increased it to four days a week. Well, now that you increased it to four days a week, you have progressed them. Or let's say that when they were with you for the first six weeks, they were doing moderate intensity exercise. And let's say they were only at three METs. And then after six weeks, um, you increased their intensity and now they're working at six METs, right? So there's a progression. So all of these things here, right? All these indicators, less than, greater than. 60 to 89 percent this is all the space you have to progress and to increase the stimuli to progress them and if we progress them with intensity and time and duration and frequency well then we start to get all of these where to go wonderful adaptations and the more we progress them the more we increase these adaptations and the more we increase these adaptations the longer we can stay on a graded exercise test and the longer we can stay on a graded exercise test the greater our vo2 max is right and the greater our peak vo2 is right so those are arrows pointing up so this is how all this works okay let's move on so um you got to think about where to begin in your textbook talks about these four types of exercise. Um, and you can look at this in your, in your textbook and kind of get it right. Um, this is pretty easy to, to make sense of. So our primary goal is to develop, to develop and maintain uh, cardiorespiratory fitness. And we want to prescribe aerobic activities um, where we're focusing on these large muscle groups, right? And if we want our clients to progress, we need to monitor them closely. Uh, we need to monitor them at the beginning. Let me go back up here, right? At the beginning when we're just understanding who they are and how, how frequently they exercise and things like that. And then we got to monitor them through their stages of progression. And then we got to reassess to see if the progressions make sense. So we must select modes of exercise that allow our participant or an individual to maintain constant exercise intensity. And we got to make sure that the intensity is not too high. And we got to make sure that the skill sets are appropriate for the people that we're working with. Okay. So some exercises require very little skill or very little physical fitness to perform them. These activities generally include walking and cycling, right? So they, they don't take a lot of skill. Um, and some of them take a bit more skill. So we have these different types of exercise that we can say, okay, once I figure out who this person is that I'm working with, right? Are they skilled? That's why I wrote that here. Uh, is it somebody that's recovering from surgery? Hmm. Yeah, they might not. They might have the skills, but they may not have, you know, it's it's too dangerous to, te to, to try those skills right now. So I think what we'll do is put them on a stationary bike where there's no risk of them falling over, right? So we might want to pick a type A exercise, right? Something that's minimal skill and a minimal fitness level required, right? Put them on a stationary bike and get them going there. So type A activities are minimal skill. Um, some of these include, again, walking or cycling or even aqua aerobics, right? Put them in a swimming pool where there's no chance of them falling over and hurting themselves. Um, or you can put somebody in a type B activity where uh, it's, it's a bit more of a vigorous intensity exercise that requires minimal skill, but average fitness. So this would be something like jogging or spinning, uh, right? Something like that. Uh, then we have type C. This requires skill and an average fitness level, right? So this one here required... Um, uh, this required an average fitness level. This requires an average fitness level. So type C would be um, endurance activities that require both skill 
and an average fitness level. So this would be like swimming or skating or skiing or cross country, right? So different, a little bit different kind of flavor than what we were talking about here. And then we have type D, which would be your recreational activities. And this could be people that are, you know, playing soccer or playing volleyball or playing baseball, right? So there, there's these kind of different levels of fitness and we got to figure out where to begin. Where are we going to drop this person? Uh, and then once we drop them in here, right, once we drop them in one of these types of, uh, fitness, how are we going to, I'm going to clean this up here. How are we going to manipulate these things? Where are we going to start them? Where are we going to advance them? And when are we going to advance them? Um, so these are all questions we have to think about. That's why I told you at the beginning, this is an art. This is you may, you may have read about this a thousand times in the textbook, but my goodness, when you start to do it with a real person, uh, I'm going to clean all this up so that when I give you guys the slides, my drawings aren't all over. Uh, when you start to work with real people and these people are all so completely different from one another, um, you got to think about these things. Okay. So where are we going to drop these people? And I'm going to clean this up. All right. That's clean. Um, and here are some things that you can kind of look at here to kind of figure out where these type activities are and what they're going to do and, uh, what would we prescribe? And again, these are just examples. So you can see type a right cycling, walking, slow dancing type B jogging and running. Obviously jogging is much different than walking and jogging and running are different. Rowing is different than uh, slow dancing, right? Stair climbing. These are a bit more intense. Um, and then these are way different than these are over here. Okay. So just kind of think about those things. Um, and I showed you, I, I was telling you guys that if we do a combination of different trainings, that they're just as effective. So you can see here, if we look at this graph here, we have heart rate beats per minute. And then down here we have exercise modes and you can see that the modalities uh, are aerobic dancing, treadmill, inline skating, stair climbing, Nordic skiing, cycling, and rowing. And you can see that these are all aerobic activities. Um, and essentially what this is demonstrating is that when we do 68% of our VO or we do an activity that's 60% of our VO2 max, it essentially is kind of, why isn't that drawing? Draw, draw, there we go, draw. We're essentially using um, the same amount of oxygen and the heart rate is essentially the same. Uh, now this aerobic dancing is slightly higher. You guys can see that that's, that's a bit higher, but for the most part, if I wanted to do treadmill one day, stair climbing the next day and cycling the next, these are essentially very much alike in their consumption of oxygen and their heart rate, right? And you can see that if we did 50% of our VO2 max, right? Versus 60% of our VO2 max, uh, treadmill, aerobic dancing and inline skating are very similar in intensity and heart rate. So what this is saying is, is you can kind of mix and match, right? You can mix and match whatever you guys want and get the same effects, which is why this says you can do a combination and you can do, where's the other one at? You can do a combination, right? Because this is showing you that it's all relevant. It's all going to produce adaptations that are favorable and increase fitness levels. Okay. Um, and then if you want to look here, here's just another way of kind of looking at intensity, right? Cause we talked about this as an indicator of intensity. We talked about, uh, th this as an indicator of intensity. Um, and then this is more traditional, right? You can see that there is very light to maximal, and you can see that you know, if we have maximal heart rate, very light is less than 30% of our heart rate. Maximal exercise is 100% of our heart rate. Very hard exercise is 90% of our maximum heart rate. And then this is equivalent to Borg's rate of perceived exertion. And there's also an equivalent to heart rate reserve. So the only reason I'm showing you this is because there's so many flavors that we can use to 
the, uh, to measure this intensity thing. So I'm going to do a whole little baby lecture on intensity, and we're going to talk about this VO2 reserve and heart rate reserve and um, you know maximum heart rate. You guys all know this calculations, but I'm going to put this all together for you guys. Hey, this is one of my slides from when I was at the University of Chicago in Illinois. Um, so I will explain all this to you guys in a bit. Um, so not on this lecture, but one that's coming right after this. Okay, so now considerations when selecting mode, right? Here is our mode, right? If we go back to this, let's just kind of tie it all together. What is our type? What are we doing to stress this aerobic system? Uh, can the intensity be progressed easily? Does mode exceed client's exercise capacity, right? So if I want to uh, put someone that's never worked out on a rowing machine before, they would die. They wouldn't last very long. Does mode present physiological problems? I'm sorry, psychological, physiological problems for the client. Sorry. Um, is mode convenient and accessible? Is mode one that clients enjoy? Uh, I cannot stand being on a treadmill and... Um, I'm sure there's other people that can't stand being on a treadmill. So we have to consider all of these. So let me just kind of go back here. Let me grab this, turn off the eraser, go home. Uh, let's grab this, let's bring it down. So that way we know we are all in agreement, right? Mr. B will ask us about this for sure. All right. So you have to know what type of mode you're going to prescribe. And this is um, one of the slides that I'm going to present with what I told you about here. Oh, this one, the intensity. So don't get bogged down by this. I will explain all of this to you in another uh, small little lecture. So we have to consider these. Okay. Then and I'll walk you through this, we have to consider these. Let me put this over here. Okay, so once we figured out the mode, we have to figure out the intensity. And ACSM recommends using a percent of your VO2 reserve.